and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. When we read in the Bible, we see the power of prayer. And on this side of the cross, one of the places we see the power of prayer, we find in, in the book of Acts. We find it written in Acts chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. It says, The former treaties have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. We also find it written, in the gospel account, told to us by St. Matthew in chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, that Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. We also find it written in the gospel account according to St. Mark in chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. We see in the Bible that from the Mount called Allah after the resurrection of Jesus, he had given unto the apostles the com great commission and to go into all the world and preach and teach the gospel message to every creature, creature making it clear unto all they spoke to that whosoever believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Jesus made it clear that they were to teach and baptize and teach again on all that he commanded a disciple, a servant to do. And we know they did this. You know why we know they did this? Because today we have the complete instruction book. Today we have the complete word of God on how to become a Christian and a servant of Jesus Christ. We can also see that Jesus instructed them to wait until they received the power from on high. We find in Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. And when he had spoken these things, while they behold, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward the heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So we have in God's word that Jesus was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight and the promise that Jesus shall return one day in like manner. So after all this happened to the apostles, according to Acts 1, they went back to Jerusalem and began to pray. Now, the next day was a Friday, and they didn't really expect the power to come to them from on high because the Lord said, You shall receive the power not many days hence. So they prayed on. The next day is Saturday. And they thought that that might be the day because it's a Sabbath day in the Jewish tradition. Might be the day the power comes did not come. They prayed on. The next day was a Sunday, first day of the week, and they reasoned out. On the first day of the week, many appearances were made by Jesus. After all, that's when he rose from the grave, was on a Sunday. Perhaps this would be the day, but nothing happened, so they prayed on. Then Monday came, 
And Tuesday came, and they prayed and prayed. Still no power from on high, so they prayed on. Wednesday came, then Thursday came. And they thought, this is the anniversary of the Lord leaving us. But nothing happened again. They prayed on. Then again, Friday came. Still, no power from on high. They prayed on. Saturday, a second Sabbath. No power came from on high. They prayed on. Then on the second Sunday, it happened. They received the power from on high. The day of Pentecost. And the church was born that day. The church the Lord made was born that day. The doors were thrown open. Notice the power did not come from the east. The power did not come from the north or the west or the south. It came straight down out of heaven. As it is written in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a, of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. We also see in Acts chapter 2, the Lord opened wide the doors of his church. And the first gospel sermons about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus was preached. We find in that first sermon, the people were told how Jesus ascended into heaven and was set down at the right hand of God and that they were all guilty of crucifying the Son of God. We see in Acts 2.37 upon here in this sermon, a sermon that was given that lifted up Jesus, a sermon that lifted Jesus up. The men, many cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And of course the apostles gave them the answer in Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. <clears throat> Now it is recorded in Acts 2.41 that on this first gospel meeting held in the church that the Lord Jesus built, the they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. 3,000 people responded to the invitation and were baptized that very day. And Luke tells us, the Lord added to them day by day those that were saved, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. The church began on the day of Pentecost, and we can really say it was after a 10-day open-ended prayer meeting that they had. What power there was in prayer. Think of the power of prayer that that had to be. Prayer is mentioned over 29 times in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is our example of how the church is supposed to be set in order. More times than any other book in the New Testament, so when we stop and look at this as our model, it's fitting that we see all this prayer in the book of Acts. So we need to think about how the church was in the beginning. How the church was in the days of our apostles. <laughs> so we're going to look at some examples. And we find in Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. 
We also see that there was a lame man, and when you read this out, from birth. And when he saw Peter and John, he asked them for alms. Now Peter and John, they didn't have no money. They were pretty well flat broke. But they said, we have no money, but we will give unto you what we have. And Peter took him by the right hand, lifted him up in the name of Jesus Christ, and he was healed and immediately entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Lesson here. Praise God for all things. As once again we see, God did not give the man what he was asking for. He gave him what he really needed. What a sermon Peter and John gave that day. And they took no credit for what happened to that man. They gave all the glory to Jesus. They gave all the glory to God the Father in heaven. Now in Acts chapter 4 we see that the number of disciples increased another 5,000. For 5,000 more were baptized and came to the Lord Jesus. Think of the power, prayer that was. And think of the bravery we see in the Apostle Peter and the Apostle John. Because we can also read about how the government of that time and all the people who were in charge at that time commanded them to stop preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. We have a great example and a great lesson for all Christians that we need to study out and understand. And there are other lessons in the Bible as well. But in Acts chapter 4, verse 19, we see Peter and John answered and said unto them. Now you got to remember, they were told to stop preaching about Jesus. And here was the answer. Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We also see in Acts chapter 4, 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Boldness is what we find in the early church. Boldness is what we find in the early Christians and what we find in the days of the apostles. Boldness in pointing out what was sin. Boldness in showing what it was that God wanted and what he demanded. There was no backing down. The early preachers stood their ground on the word of God. We can read... That because of the healing of a lame man and the tremendous results, Peter and John were arrested. Think of that. All they did was go in there and preach the truth about Jesus, and they were arrested. And basically at the trial, the authorities perceived the boldness of Peter and John, and they couldn't understand it because they knew they were unlearned men. They were ignorant men in their eyes because these men were highly educated men. And this Peter and John, they were just fishermen. And they knew that the knowledge they had was because of Jesus. But since the man was healed, and he was standing there, they couldn't deny what happened. So they had to let him go, warning them not to ever do that again. Peter and John, they returned to their own company and reported all that the chief priests had said unto them. We understand in time. That all of them, all the apostles except for John, were put to death over a period of time. And it wasn't an easy death. It was a very cruel death. And yet, they still continued to preach the word of God. And yet we have so many today who are so afraid to talk about sin and what is right and what is wrong because they might be called a name or so. We need to pray. We need to pray like they did in the days of the apostles. Think about that. Today, many will say, well, you know, it's not like those days. You're right. It's not like those days. You're not going to get killed for praying like they did in the apostles' time. Some say, man, we need to play it cool. You know, we need to say as little possible about Jesus' church while we're out there in the world. You know, 
We don't want all that pushback from the unwashed. How are you going to get them into your building? I read an article today from a so-called church that says, well, you know, we need to tone it down because if you start talking about sin, you're never going to get people to come into the building. I'm thinking, okay. I don't think that's the way it was done in the days of the apostles. In Acts chapter 4, verse 25, look at what they did. And understand, this is the church Jesus built. And they got together for a prayer meeting, and they prayed. And now, Lord, beholding their threatening, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, it tells us the place was shaken where they were gathered together. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spake the words of God with boldness. Do we understand this? Peter and John were threatened. They were cursed for being bold about Jesus. And what did they do in response? They prayed to be more bold in their preaching and teaching. Boldness is the element that is lacking in much of the preaching today. And it's sad. We have the examples right here of the boldness of the preachers of those days and we see the results. Should we not be following in those examples? Many today feel that you really got to be careful in preaching differently than what the majority wants to hear. You know, many people are offended when you talk about the terms of pardon. If you preach today as they did on the day of Pentecost, and you regards of repentance and baptism for remission of sin, many people say, oh, we can't do that. Don't preach that. It's going to offend some people. Can I speak of the evils of our government? Even though they murder children for money, promote homosexual agenda to the children, so many have bought into the devil's lie. You know, the devil is really a great deceiver. And someday we need to really do a little study on him to see. But think of this. How long has it been now that the devil has convinced people that, oh, it's the woman's body. It's her right to choose what goes on in her body. That is a child in her body. It is not her right to murder that child. The end of conversation. But the devil will tell you, and his minions will tell you, why it's the woman's right. It's the woman's right. And of course, we know on my lands, we can't talk about homosexuals because after all, you'd be called a homophobe. <sighs> you know, when you read about Peter and John and all the apostles and, and Paul, how they were threatened, they were beaten, and they still prayed to have the boldness to preach, and someone calls you a homophobe and you cave. The devil's got it so easy today. Some might say, well, it's different today. God no longer shakes his church buildings to show his approval. However, this is a mistaken ideal as well. God is still in the shaking business. We find in Hebrews chapter 12, 26, his voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also the heaven. The word signify the removing of things that are shaken and the things that are made and the things which are not shaken may remain. Wherefore, receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken is what we're looking for. Let us have grace whereby we may offer service well-pleasing to God with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. We just saw that. There are some things that cannot be shaken. Do you know that? The church that Jesus built cannot be shaken. And the word of God 
is another that cannot be shaken. When the world starts shaking, stand on the Word of God. Have the Holy Ghost in you, and you are in great shape. The Bible is clear. When the Lord gives the world that final shake, the only firm place to stand will be on the Word of God. How do I know this? The Apostle Peter lets us know this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. He says, See ye, purify your soul and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfriended love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart, frequently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flowers of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Pray for boldness. Pray for boldness. However, we know that too many people today, boldness comes with too high a price tag. They don't want to be called names. They don't want to be labeled as a Bible thumper. You know, the church of Jerusalem prayed for boldness. And we know that the apostles were beaten. And we know that Stephen was put on trial for his life. And that Stephen was stoned because of his boldness and his preaching. But did it stop him? No. They went everywhere preaching. We know that the church of Jerusalem was split up and scattered throughout the world because of Saul. Did it stop them from preaching when they left? No, they preached more into the world. But so many today are scared to pay that price. So here's something you might want to think about. Because this is basically what they're saying. Preach a sermon, preacher. Make it short and sweet. Our stomachs are a hundred. At eleven o'clock we eat. Preach a sermon, preacher. Make it round or flat. We love to play hide and seek and guess just where you're at. Preach a sermon, preacher. Fill it with some jokes. Tell us some anecdotes and entertain us folks. Preach a sermon, preacher. Don't get too pacific. As long as you will generalize, we'll think you are terrific. Preach a sermon, preacher. Tell us what you like to hear. And we'll pat your spineless back while you scratch our itching ears. Think about what we saw so far, the power of prayer. We see this power of prayer in Acts 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, all the way up. And the prayer is what they did. Whenever they got in trouble, they went to God in prayer. In Acts chapter 6, we find the Lord's church had a problem. From what we can see, evidentially, some of the widows, it seems, were neglected. And there was a lot of murmuring going on in the congregation about this problem. Think about it for a moment. Here we have a situation. The church at Jerusalem, at that time, and it always has been, the only church that ever existed that had 12 apostles on what we would call today the staff. 12 apostles on the staff. Think of it, 12 apostles. And the church was murmuring. If they murmured with 12 apostles, what chances a preacher have today? How can a preacher please everybody today when they can't even, the 12 apostles couldn't do it? The apostles had an answer. And they called a congregational meeting and they informed them. And their time was completely taken up. They did not have time to physically take care of all the widows and all the orphans and everything that needed to be done like this. And they had, because they needed to preach and teach, and they needed to study. The apostles made it clear in Acts chapter 6, verse 2. It is not reason that we should lead the word of God and serve tables. <clears throat> they weren't saying they were too good to do this. But they were saying this was not their duty. And we know that we are all assigned a duty in the Lord's church. 
But the apostles did not neglect or act as if there was no problem. They gave unto the people a solution. And we find a solution written in Acts chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. The apostles said unto the people, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report for the Holy Ghost and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The lesson example for us today from the Apostles' Doctrine is that preaching and praying is the primary work of the evangelists, the preachers, the elders. But the elders and the deacons truly have other things to address. And we need to study and pray on these things so that we understand what our duties are in the Lord's church. We do not want to hinder the church from growing. Preaching does not seem to be the chief concern today, though. We see more preachers interested in being a counselor or a psychiatrist or some kind of youth minister. Now, many will say, well, what's wrong with that? Nothing's wrong with it. But where are the real preachers? The church did not begin with a counseling session. It began with preaching and teaching. A good preacher is a counselor. For every time a sermon is preached, that preacher should be counseling everyone who hears the message in the ways of the Lord our God. How one should be living in the ways of the Lord our God. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18, says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. We also know from the word of God, we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 19, that the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. What this nation really needs are more evangelists. We don't need more lawyers. We don't need more scientists. We don't need more politicians. We need more evangelists who are bold in the word of God, just as they were in the days of the apostle. Think of the power of the prayer that was used to solve the problem of the day that we just saw in Acts 6 for the congregation. We need to pray for the preachers to have more time to preach and teach. This is not what is needed today. Pray for time to preach the word of God. We find in the book of Acts chapter 10 where Luke tells us about the prayer that really led to worldwide evangelism. Peter <coughs> was in the city of Joppa residing in the home of Simon the Tanner. He had a great desire to pray. He went up on the top of the roof of the house to pray. Now his prayer wasn't really recorded, but judging from the results of his prayer, his prayer might have been something about evangelism. It seemed he prayed, he became hungry and desired to eat. While they were getting things ready, he fell into a trance and saw a vision. And the way it's explained to us in the Bible, a great sheet was let down out of heaven, held by the four corners, and in the sheet all kinds of four-footed beasts and creepy things of the earth and birds of the heaven. And a voice cried out, Peter, rise, Peter, kill and eat. It says most, if not all the beasts, were unclean to Peter, being that he was a Jew, he would not obey the voice of the vision, which was the voice of God. Now Peter might have said something like this to the Lord. Lord, I have done many terrible things in my life. I cut a person's ears off. I swore before the enemies of Jesus that I was not one of his disciples. I even told him I didn't even know him. For these sins, Lord, I have repented with bitter tears. But the one thing I've never done, or ever will do, Lord, I've never 
been so deprived, so evil, so lured down that I would stoop so low to eat a ham sandwich or a BLT. But we see in Acts chapter 10, verse 14, Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Now while Peter thought what this vision might mean, some men arrived from the Gentile centurion named Cornelius, who on the instructions from God himself was told to go send for Peter so that he could hear the word of God. Now think about this. This would be unthinkable for Peter to go into a Gentile's house and he wants me to share the gospel message with a Gentile? But Peter understood from the vision that when he prayed and he prayed that the conversion was to include all mankind. He finally understood the great commission that said, the gospel shall be preached to every creature, not just some of them. We need to understand this as well today. For we need to share the gospel message with all the world, not just the ones here in our area. Now, I agree, we are not able to all go out into the world and preach the gospel message. But we can help. We can help by funding the different preachers who are out truly spreading the word of God, spreading the true gospel message in the different areas. You know, Peter saw a sheep let down out of heaven. He was challenged with what he saw in the sheep. But is there not a sheep let down for us today? You know, the New Testament. Are these not sheets? Are these not the written word of God? Are these not the things that we should be spreading around and sharing with people? We need to think about these things. We see it written, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. Think about this. Tithes and offerings. How can we help spread the gospel message here on this earth? Tithes and offerings are used by God. And what are tithes and offerings? Everything we have is on loan to us by God. It's not ours. It belongs to Jesus. And all he's doing, all we're doing is paying a little bit of rent. 10%. No big deal. And if we use this, tithes and offerings, we can use this to support the ministries around us. I truly feel we're doing a fairly good job of supporting ministries. We support the ministry of Ed Bowsman. We support the ministries of Mike Bridenball and Rick Bridenball. We help to support Barry Kamini in his journey over Africa. And we know that they're taking and they're using this money and they're preaching and teaching the gospel message, the true gospel message. Think of the power of prayer when we pray to help these men. And think of the power of prayer when Peter saw that sheet thinking, of, wow, okay, I can now eat a BLT, and it turns out he's now an evangelist to the whole world. You see, when we pray, we never know what we're going to open up. We need to pray for Ed Bowsen's ministry. I know it's in trouble a little bit. We need to pray for Mike Bridenball's ministry and Rick Bridenball's ministry. We need to pray for Barry Kamini, that they stay strong in the word. They stay strong in might in the gospel message as they preach and teach unto the world. You realize that that is part of our duty. And that is our part of being the body. You see, we're part of the body. And we need the whole body fit it together in order to make it all work. The prayer for evangelism is needed in the Lord's church today. Just as it was in the days of the apostles. They sent the preachers out, did they not, into the world? That's what we're doing today. Not everybody is going out into the world to preach. 
but we can do our part to help. You know, we see the power of prayer when we study the Bible, and it's still here today. It's still the same power. A young man asked his grandfather when one should pray. The grandfather said, you should start the day before you die. Grandson said, but grandfather, how will I know when you, I will die? Grandfather said, you do not know. That's why you pray every day. Jesus tells all, you must be born again. You must be born again with the water and the spirit in order to find heaven. But man claims this is not true. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus died for your sins. He died for my sins. Jesus sealed the deal with God, the Father in heaven with his blood. What did man do? The question always is, and the question we need to ask the world, who died for you? Whose church is it? Who built the church and what church is Jesus Christ coming back for? For that truly is what we need to understand. We need to pray. Pray for those who are out doing evangelism in the world. We need to do our part as a Christian, as a servant of God. That is our talents, is helping these things. I'll leave you with Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Amen? So let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Tonight, if you're outside of Christ for any reason, why would you be? You know, the blood that you have when you came to the Lord and you were underneath that watery grave and you came up a new creature in Christ, it's still there. It covers the sins. Repent. Don't let the devil trick you like he did Judas. Peter and all have fallen away, but they came back. They repented. They came back, and the Lord accepted them back, and he will accept you too. And if you don't have the blood of the Lord, what is holding you back? What, are you going to wait the day before you die? Do you know when you're going to die? Do it now. We need to be in the Lord's fold. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. In the arms of Christ my Savior.